you, John. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, for leading in the venue this morning while uh, Tyler is out. It's been a great day of worship already, and now a time to come and look into God's Word and hear what He has to say to us. Have you ever had to repeat yourself? Not just because someone didn't hear what you said, but because they weren't really listening or perhaps time went by and they forgot. If you're a parent, I know you've certainly had to repeat yourself. Kids don't seem to know to stop and listen, do they? I remember when Jordan, our son, middle child, was uh, about eight or nine, I guess. Uh, Not that he's any better at listening now. He's almost 31. But when he was eight or nine, I hope he's watching. Um, Man, he he was fun, but he was like a little puppy, just out of control, you know? I'd say, hey, Jordan, and he'd come bouncing in. Would you please go to the garage and he's gone. So I'd get him back, you know, and eventually you learn what you have to do is kind of take both sides of the face, right? Okay, look me in the eye, watch my lips while I tell you what I need you to do. If you're a parent, you've had to repeat yourself. If you're a teacher, you certainly, as part of the learning process, have had to uh, repeat some core principles. You probably had to repeat yourself on how you wanted work done in your classroom. If you've been a a coach, you certainly had to repeat yourself and remind players of the basic foundations and skills of the game. And sometimes if you're a pastor, you have to repeat yourself. I've told you the story before of the young pastor who went to his first church at a seminary, and he went there in view of a call and just preached an incredible message. They voted to call him, and they thought, man, this is the best preacher. We've got ourselves a dandy here. They were so excited. And the first Sunday he came to preach, when he was now pastor of the church, he preached the same message. Well, they thought that was kind of odd, but, you know, he's been moving. Maybe he didn't have time to prepare. The second Sunday, the same message. The third Sunday in a row that he preached the same message, the deacons pulled him aside after the service and said, listen, pastor, we don't know what the problem is. Maybe you're not having enough time to study. Maybe we're, we're too draining on you, too needy. But you can't keep preaching the same sermon. you got to prepare another sermon. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll stop preaching this sermon when you start practicing it. I was having a conversation with a couple of other staff pastors in, in the last few weeks, and we decided it was good that we repeat the neighboring series. You may remember four years ago, we did a series called The Art of Neighboring. Uh, it has been four years. That's one good reason to repeat it. But also, just coming out of the Revelation series, where we talked about what is to come at the end and those who are not prepared, and realizing that because COVID is declining, society is beginning to open up more, we thought it would be a good idea. So I'm just letting you know this morning, this introduction is just to tell you I'm not a crazy old man that's repeating myself without realizing it, okay? And it's important enough that that it bears repeating. You know, when we we have a challenge, we often start strong, but as time goes on, our our enthusiasm wanes, or we get busy, and and we hit the pause button, and and we just forget to come back uh, to those things. And listen, I'm in the the same boat as you. I'm not just preaching to you. Uh, Life has been crazy COVID has made it uh, difficult to neighbor this last year, but as I've been studying again through these texts and preparing to preach again, it's been challenging me, and it's been reminding me of my need to obey the command to love my neighbor. In fact, I've already got this week uh, two convictions of action steps that I need to take and that I will be taking and letting you know about that. You know, as I um, study, as I prepare, as I let the Spirit of God deal with me, I recognize that my obedience has the potential to change not just my life, but to change the lives of others. And I hope as you, as we walk through this series over the next few weeks, you'll be thinking about how obedience to the Word of God should change your life and also the lives of those who are within your sphere of influence. In a few minutes, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 10. If you want to begin turning there, we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. While you're turning, let me tell you about something exciting, a good neighboring thing coming up next Sunday. Next Sunday night... We're going to have a community-wide prayer gathering, as you remember we did about a year ago, um, out uh, at River Center in Benton over next door to Holland Chapel. We'll be gathered out there Thursday, May the 6th. The first Thursday in May has, has been for years the National Day of Prayer. So we're going to, on next Sunday night, uh, honor the fact that our nation has been called to pray. And next Sunday night, we're going to gather with churches uh, from all around the communities around us and, and gather at 6 o'clock 
Uh, Tyler Burleson, one of our worship pastors, will be leading worship that night, and we'll be praying for our nation next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Hope you'll plan to be a part of that. Well, we're going to spend the next month reviewing uh, the challenge or renewing the challenge to neighbor. The series is called The Art of Neighboring. And the question this morning is, what is that about and what does that have to do with following Jesus? Four years ago, I was handed a book and read the story of a community, uh, Arvada, near Denver, where the church leaders had begun to realize the church was really not making much of an impact in their community. And so the church leaders in Arvada gathered together. They began to ask some questions, how they could make a more significant impact. And they said, well, you know, what we need to do is really understand what all the challenges are. And so they invited uh, the city officials to come in, and they asked them these questions. What is your dream for our city? And if you could wave a magic wand to change Arvada, what would you change? And the leaders basically came up with three needs in their city, and this is probably true in every city, no at-risk kids, no isolated uh, elderly or shut-ins, and no single moms living below poverty level. Now, you hear those things, and it's natural if we hear those things about our own city, our own community, it's natural to think, well, those are issues that the government should address or take care of. But, you know, the problem with that, if you've seen this happen before, the problem with that is the government starts a lot of programs and attempts to meet a lot of needs, and a lot of money gets wasted and funding runs out. And honestly, when you think about the needs that exist in our communities, exist in the cities where we live, those needs are better met through relationships. And so these city leaders basically said to the church, if you really want to have a big impact, you need to start a neighboring movement. Now, when I read that, I figured that was probably, those comments were probably pretty universal, but I I fired off a quick email to a former mayor in the uh, central Arkansas area, and I asked that mayor um, about this whole idea of neighboring, and I asked that mayor to confirm that the needs and issues in our cities would be solved if the churches would begin to neighbor. And this is a response I got, part, part of it. I would go so far to say that the strengths of any neighborhood that are sustainable over time are the byproduct of great neighboring. And the weaknesses could be mostly minimized, if not completely eliminated, with some intentional, heartfelt neighboring. You see, that's not something, when we see the issues in our our neighborhoods, in our communities, those needs are not civic issues. It's not something that city leaders uh, should necessarily be giving their time to work on. The, The city leaders, city government, can't make people be good neighbors, and they're probably not the best source um, for how we ought to neighbor. What do we talk about here at the church? We talk about primarily getting the gospel out, impacting society, impacting our cities, being, being salt and light. And Jesus has given us a plan to do that. Jesus has said the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. So what if we did what he said? What if I did what he said? You know, anytime we study the commands of Scripture, whether it's individually or collectively like this, when I study the commands of Scripture individually, I need to ask the question, am I doing that? You need to ask the question, am I doing that? We need to ask the question, are are we doing that? And the reality for most of us, at least my reality, I assume it's yours as well, is I, I think about my neighbors. I know that some of my neighbors need Jesus. I know that I need to build relationships with my neighbors, but I'm busy. And life is complicated, and building relationships is messy. And when I see my neighbors, I say hello, and I try to be friendly, but I'm not always intentional in the way that Jesus is talking about when he says that we should love our neighbors. So that's that's why you and I need to be reminded of some, some foundational, basic understanding of living out our faith. We're here for a reason. God didn't save you just to welcome you home to heaven one day to spend eternity with him. He left you here after you were saved, and you're here for a reason. You hear me say all the time, we're blessed to be a blessing. That's not just talking about our finances. It's talking about our life. God has given us life, and God has blessed us in order to bless others. We're not just saved for eternity. We're saved to serve in the here and now. We're to be salt and light, and we're to get out the message of the gospel. That's best done in the context of relationships And that means that we've got to get up close and personal with people. Look with me this morning in Luke 10, beginning in verse 25. Luke 10, 25, we'll be reading down through verse 37. 
On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go thou and do likewise. Now, this expert in the law came to Jesus actually to, to trap him. They often did that. He asked him a very simple question, which had a very simple answer. And it's interesting, the answer this man gave that Jesus affirmed is from Scripture. You know, anytime someone talks to you about your faith, you can't go wrong answering with Scripture. You may feel like, well, I don't have all the answers, but if you know what the Word of God says, that's all you need to know. I love what Spurgeon said. Scripture's like a lion chained up. You don't have to defend it. Just turn it loose and it will defend itself. And so this man answered, and Jesus affirmed, first from Deuteronomy 6, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then from Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. I love Jesus' methodology, too. The man comes and asks him the question, and his response is, well, what do you think? You see, he knew he already knew the answer. Sometimes I use this methodology if someone comes to me for advice and I know they're coming not really to hear what I think or what God's Word has to say. They're coming because they either want me to affirm something they already think or they're hopeful I'll give them an answer different than what they know is to be true. And so I usually say that. What do you think? I've got one particular friend that frustrates him to no end, but I always ask him, well, what do you think? So it's a simple question, a simple answer. The expert knew the answer. But notice, when, when the answer is given and the answer is affirmed, he, he wants to feel good. He wants to justify himself. He wants Jesus to tell him he's a good neighbor. And so when he asks the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus tells this very familiar parable of the good Samaritan. And the unexpected surprise was it was the Samaritan who was a good neighbor because he was neighboring a Jew. Now, if you don't know why that's significant, let me explain. The Samaritans and Jews despise each other. The Samaritans were half-breeds. When the, when the northern kingdom was conquered, many of the Jews were carried off, but the Jews who remained there in the northern kingdom intermarried with their Gentile captors, and the Jews believed that these half-breeds, these Samaritans, these half-Jews, had basically sold out their birthright. They brought impurity into the Jewish race, and so they hated each other. In fact, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much, if they were traveling north to south from Jerusalem, If they were traveling, for example, going down to Jericho, if they were traveling, they typically would have to go through Samaria as the most direct route, and they wouldn't do that. The Jews, if they were traveling and had to go through Samaria, would walk a long distance around because they didn't even want the dirt of Samaria on their sandals. And so here comes a Samaritan, despised by this Jewish man who's been beaten and left half dead and been robbed. And not only did he do what the two Jewish religious leaders wouldn't do, he went above and beyond for his enemy, for one who hated him. And that was Jesus' picture of a good neighbor. Now, let's, let's just kind of do some personal evaluation of how well we love our neighbors by considering what Jesus tells us of the Samaritan in this parable. First thing you see is he was on a journey. You know, it's not likely he would have been in this part of the country on a leisure trip as a Samaritan. He probably, very likely, was there on a business journey, yet he stopped. 
and delayed his business dealings. He could have easily done like the priest and the Levite and said, I'm too busy, I've got things going on, I've got to be somewhere, but he stopped and delayed his business. Secondly, you notice he doesn't even pause in going to the man. He doesn't ponder, wait a minute, th- this man is different. He doesn't stop to think about what's going to happen if, if I'm taking care of this Jewish man as a Samaritan. That he wouldn't even want to be touched by me if he's really a true Jew. He wouldn't want me to touch him or be anywhere even in his, in his breathing space. What's going to happen if the eyes fluttered open and he wakes up while I'm treating him? What's going to happen? He didn't consider that. He didn't ponder that. He gives careful attention to tending the man's needs. He binds up his wounds. That's got to be taking up not only a lot of time, time time-consuming, but also very messy. Think about this. If he's going to bandage the man's wounds, when he finds the man, the man has nothing. He's even stripped of his clothing. So for him to bandage, bandage the man's wounds, he probably had to take some of his own clothing out of his travel bag to tear into strips in order to bind this man's wounds. And then it says that he used oil and wine. Travelers typically, if they're going to be on a long journey, carried oil to cook with, wine to drink. And he used those of his own possessions on that man, knowing this man can't repay. He's been robbed. He has nothing. And likely he put clothes on the man, and again, that would have had to have been his own clothing. Notice it says in Scripture that he poured oil and wine on the man's wounds. He, he wasn't skimping. He was being very generous with what he had and lavishly caring for this man. He's not doing the minimum. He's doing the maximum that he can do, giving his best, the best of himself, the best of his possessions to an enemy. Put him on his donkey. Now, if he put the man on his donkey, that means that he was walking, and if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, you know that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a very dangerous road to travel. What happened to this man happened to many people. So for this Samaritan to put the man on his donkey and to walk himself was putting himself in danger. He brought him to an inn, and and it says he took care of him. And verse 35 says the next day, evidently he took care of him and was by this man's bedside all through the night taking care of his wounds. The next day he paid two denarii for the man to be cared for. Now, we don't know um, the the quality of this inn. That's not an advertisement. Um, We don't know the quality of the inn this man was in. But two denarii would have covered on a lower end one month, on a higher, excuse me, on a lower end, one, higher end one month, lower end two months. It would have covered one to two months of shelter and food and rest. So he paid for somewhere between 30 and 60 days of shelter and food and rest for this man to recover. And he offered to cover any additional expenses when he came back. So what we see in the Samaritan is he set his agenda aside. He gave of his time and his possessions. He sacrificed financially for a stranger who was his worst enemy. Now, the expert in the law, why why did he ask who is my neighbor? The expert in the law thought, as long as you care for people like yourself, another Jew, as long as you care for people who care for you, you're a good neighbor. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus gives a totally different picture of what it means to love your neighbors yourself. It means to love people who are different from you. It means to love people who may not like you. It means to love people who may not appreciate what you've done for them. And and it's messy, and it's time-consuming, and it's sacrificial, and it might even be a little bit dangerous. So the question for us is, where do we practice neighboring? Who, Who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love like that? Well, the Samaritan and the Jew, not just because they were of different ethnic groups, the Samaritan and the Jew were were total strangers. So from what Jesus is saying here, apparently anyone we encounter in need is a neighbor. I personally believe when I encounter someone in need out in the community, I personally believe that God doesn't bring people across my path for no reason. It's not coincidental. So a stranger can be my neighbor. A coworker can be my neighbor. The mom on your child's soccer team can be your neighbor. Anyone, any person that you encounter can be your neighbor. When, you're, when you leave the country with us and you go on a mission trip to one of our international points where we serve, those people you serve are your neighbor, right? So we look at this teaching and we say, well, according to what Jesus is saying here, everyone is my neighbor. And that's certainly true, but for most of us, the problem is when everyone is my neighbor, no one is my neighbor. I 
I can't love everyone. I need to love someone. My neighboring, my love for neighbor needs to be very focused and very strategic. I can't say I'm a good neighbor just because I encounter people around the city and help them with their need. I can't say I'm a good neighbor just because I go to other places and other countries and help meet needs. Honestly, neighboring those we don't live around, it's pretty easy. It's not as messy, not as much fuss. There's no long-term commitment. But what about the people that live around me, the people that work around me, the people that I see consistently day after day? What about the neighbor across the street? What about the neighbor next door? Are they, are they lesser than this neighbor? Was Jesus not talking about them? The expert in the law asked, who is my neighbor? Scripture says because he was trying to justify himself, he was, he was doing what? He was looking for a loophole. That's, that's what we always do. We get convicted about something in Scripture, and, and it's not something we feel very good about. We start looking for the loophole, right? Well, you don't know my neighbors. You don't know how difficult they would be to love. You don't know how busy I am or how complicated my life is, how much I have going on in my life. Well, let's just be real honest. It's harder to neighbor our physical neighbors, the people that live around us, because relationships are messy, because we can't walk away. Well, I guess you could. I guess you could move every time it gets too hard to love your neighbor. You can pick up and move and go somewhere else, right? It's easier to neighbor an unnamed, unknown neighbor for a few minutes than it is to invest your life neighboring someone close by. Here's the reality. If I can't neighbor those around me, if I can't love those around me, then I'm really not loving, not neighboring anybody. Now, we're not all <clears throat> at the level the Good Samaritan was. We're probably not going to get there in the next four weeks, but let's just start with some neighboring basics. You know the first step to being a good neighbor? It's to know your neighbor's name. Do you know your neighbor's names? When you drive down the street, when, when, when I drive down the street and I see a neighbor out, I, I will typically do one of three things based on the level of relationship. I'll either wave, my window's down, I might say, hey man, or I'll wave and say, hey, John, how's it going? Or I'll pull over when I see my neighbor out. Hey, John, I see Bobby's home from college. He got plans for this summer? Now, what's the difference in that? It's, it's whether they're a stranger or an acquaintance or we have a relationship with them. And if we're going to neighbor properly, if we're going to obey the great commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we have to move from stranger to acquaintance to relationship. I want you to take just a minute, and, and if you need to close your eyes to do this, that's fine. I want you to take just a minute, and in your mind's eye, I want you to picture your neighbors. Now, you may not live in a neighborhood where it's perfectly blocked streets. Even if you're in a rural area, I want you to picture the, the four, five, or six houses closest to you. Can you see those houses? Do you know who lives in those houses? Knowing a name is a big deal. Hey, John is very different than hey, man. Do you know who lives around you? Do you know their names? And let's be honest, you may not like your neighbors. There may be some neighbors who are going to be very, very difficult to develop a relationship with. There are going to be some neighbors that don't respond at all. They don't want anything to do with you. It's, it's going to be messy. But the reality is that God put you with those neighbors for those neighbors. You don't live where you live because you like that style of house, because you like that floor plan, because it was the right district for your kids, school. That's not why you live there. You live there because God put you there for those neighbors. Paul in Acts 17, when he was in Athens, 
was explaining how God has revealed himself to man. And in Acts 17, 26 and 27, he writes these words. From one man, he, God, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the earth. Listen, he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. He appointed their times and he appointed the boundaries of their land. What if God put you where you are so that those around you would seek him? You and I have an incredible and exciting venture before us. God wants people to reach out and seek him. And and what you and I are, very simply, I don't know any other way to state it, we're we're the handles. We're what they can grab onto to get to God. We're, We're Jesus with skin on. We can talk to them about Jesus or we can talk to them about Jesus and display Jesus to them in how we neighbor them. God did this so that men would seek him starts with the name. You know, and sometimes to get the name, you have to eat crow. I've got this one neighbor, and and I'm not going to say names today because my wife gets on to me when I say names, and then she calls Billy and says, cut that out in case they're watching. But I've got this one neighbor. I know his first name, not that I've ever really talked to him. I don't even know his wife's name, don't know his kids. And I'm going to have to eat crow in the next week and go over there and introduce myself, even though I've been living there two years. And learn their, learn their names. Starts with the name. It, it moves from, hey man, to how are you with a sincere desire to hear and respond to how they are. And, and then it goes to looking for opportunities for involvement. I've got a, another neighbor that I've been developing a relationship with, and he's building a barn And he really is not healthy enough to do some of the things he's doing. So I've gone to him and said, hey, why don't you let me help you haul some of that stuff up before you start on the second floor involvement? Can I help you? Or even better, getting him to help me. Listen, when you ask your neighbor to help you with something, when you make yourself in in need of your neighbor, that does an incredible thing to build a relationship. What do we need to do to neighbor? We need to know their names. We need to look for opportunities. I had a young man in my first uh, student group <clears> that Emmanuel Baptist in Pine Bluff, Stephen. Stephen hasn't always lived a, a really good life, but Stephen has a good solid foundation, and Stephen knows the Lord, and, and Stephen knows the importance of getting the gospel out. And Stephen lived here in Little Rock until about a year ago. And I remember Stephen telling me how he had kind of gotten burdened that he didn't know his neighbors, he didn't know the kids that his kids hung out with in the neighborhood, so he made a very strategic decision. He moved his grill from the back patio to the driveway. And two or three times a week, he would grill, and he and his family would sit out in the driveway while he's grilling and would sit in the driveway eating dinner so that they could see their neighbors and speak to their neighbors. And pretty soon, guess what? A lot of kids were hanging out at their house. A lot of parents were coming out. You want to know where your kid's hanging out, right? It's a simple decision to move from the back inside the privacy fence out front. That's what we've got to do to be good neighbors. It's time for us as a church to move out front and engage the people God has placed around us that they might seek to know him.